morning. If you will, um, bow with me in prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for the, our time today. Lord, accept it as an offering of praise and thanksgiving. Lord, I ask that you hide me behind the shadow of the cross. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, Lord, be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, good morning again. I appreciate Chad uh, and always Jill um, serving in our worship. So, we thank you for helping light the candle this morning. We're going to continue today with our Advent series uh, as we prepare our hearts and, and minds for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we started our series. We talked about hope. We lit the first candle. We talked about actively waiting. Uh, while we are waiting, we talked about how we can allow the Lord to work in and through us and how we are providing hope in, in our ministries here uh, at Barber United Methodist Church and in our charge ministries as well. Uh, we talked about providing hope, though, ultimately beginning with our thoughts, but then putting those uh, thoughts into action through our, wor our words and our actions. So today we'll continue our, uh, our speaking about uh, peace which uh, represents our second candle today, and then over the next couple of Sundays, we'll uh, speak about love and joy. When we look back at our psalm from today, the uh, Psalm 85, the, uh, psal the psalmist is speaking about restoration. He, is, uh, he talks about remembering the past, and we've talked about that before, how, is, how important it is for us to look at our past, and particularly in the scriptures, even when we need encouragement, we can look in the, in the Holy Scriptures and, and look how God was with those who have gone on before us. The God was with those. He heard their cries. So we talk about how important it is for us to, the psalmist talks about remembering the past. He talks about acknowledging God's favor, uh, God's blessings. And then he speaks about uh, acknowledging the Lord's forgiveness. All of that we see. And he asked, the psalmist asked for restoration. And then he emphasized the importance of waiting and listening. We talked about that active waiting uh, last week uh, uh, when we were speaking about hope. And we talked about that word, uh, hatikva, that, active, that Hebrew word, actively, actively waiting. Now, uh, I, I was reading through, as I was studying this week, I have a, a book of, about the Psalms, and it's uh, by a man named Timothy Keller. And he speaks about this psalm as providing a blueprint for revival. Uh, we and I was thinking, you know, about this time of the year, and at first I was thinking, well, is this a revival time of the year? And I thought, well, yeah, it is, because we're talking about preparing our hearts in this Advent season for the coming of Christ, uh, for the birth of Christ that we, of course, celebrate every year, but then also ultimately for the coming of Christ, uh, in when He comes back uh, in in glory to establish His kingdom here on earth. So I think that we could consider this time as a, an opportunity for a revival. Uh, we might also think about this as a uh, time for restoration or revitalization. And so Timothy Keller, in this uh, devotion book that I was uh, looking at, he says there are some steps that we can take based on the, the, whole, the sacred scripture. He says first, the first thing in implementing this blueprint of revival is to study the past. Uh, looking at seasons of revival, and I talked about that earlier, about how important it is for us to remember in the past um, about those who have gone before us, about looking in the scripture. Um, if you look back in the, in the psalm, he says, Lord, you were favorable to your land, you restored the fortunes of Jacob. So the psalmist is looking back how God showed favor, showed blessings on the people, and restored the people of Jacob to their land. Next, the next uh, step that Keller says is repentance. The, ex the psalmist in, in our passage today, he acknowledges that our hard hearts, sometimes our sin, or maybe even we've talked about before, sometimes our worry, even those things, can cause that barrier between us and God. It's not that God isn't there, but it's that maybe we've done something, or maybe even, like I said, worry. And I know that's hard, but maybe, th so those things could potentially cause that barrier. So he talks about repenting, of the, whatever those situations are, if there are barriers between us and God. Uh, he says, this is uh, verses 4 and 5 from, the, from our scripture, from the psalm. He says, Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? 
The next thing Keller says that we must do is to cry out to God to in prayer uh, that and pray that He will show us His <coughs> steadfast love. We've talked about how God does hear our prayers. We can go back into the Scripture. We know that He heard the cries of Hagar when she had been uh, removed from her family and thought, where in the world am I going to go? Well, God answered her prayers. We know that God heard the prayers of Ruth when she uh, was uh, left without a husband, when her mother-in-law was about to go back to her homeland, and, uh, and she decided that, of course, she would go with uh, her mother-in-law, but God heard her prayers, uh, and then we can just go on. We know God heard the cries of David, and ultimately we know, we know that God heard the cries of Jesus. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was uh, sweating uh, uh, drops of blood, literally sweating drops of blood, and God, what, heard his cry and even sent an angel to prepare him. So we've talked about that, how God hears our prayers, he hears our cries. Carol says we must cry out to God in prayer, that he will show us his steadfast love, unfailing love. And we talked about that last week, how that, uh, in, in prior, that, that steadfast love, we can call that that is called hesed, that Hebrew word hesed. It is that unfailing love, that love that, uh, the steadfast love and faithfulness that renews every morning. We can count on that. He says in verse 7, show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. He's speaking about that steadfast love, that hesed, the unlimited grace, mercy, compassion, and favor that, like I said, it begins every day. And, and glory be to God for that, that, that we can start over a new slate with that uh, promise. Now, the next thing he says, Keller says, the last thing that we do in that plan of that sort of spirit of revival is to wait. And we, we, we have said before, sometimes that's difficult, but we can actively wait. But he says to wait and listen on the word. When we go back to the psalm in verses 8 and 9, he says, the psalmist says, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. So if we turn to him in our hearts and are faithful, then he will speak to us. He finally says, surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. If we fear the Lord, not fear as in I'm afraid, but as in worship and adoration and awe and respect. If we fear the Lord, then his salvation is available to us. So all of this is about listening through the Word, through the sacred scriptures, through, uh, sometimes God speaks to us through the fellowship of others, uh, uh, and about just trying to discern when God is speaking to us. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but it might come in the stillness of the night, or maybe during our time of meditation and prayers. So as we speak of peace, let's talk about when the object of peace or the intent of peace was made available. At the point in time when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the intersection of the law and love took place. We talked about the law. There was the law, truth, and righteousness. These were the guiding principles set forth in the sacred scripture. We talked about the Ten Commandments. But remember, we talked about also in, in, in previous weeks about how the people weren't obedient. They weren't following the law and commandments. They weren't following the system, so what? They needed a Savior. God. They needed God to provide a Savior. We talked about how the sinful nature, they weren't following the system, uh, and so ultimately God would provide that Savior. God gave us a perfect Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. He came down from earth, from heaven in the form of a baby. He became a man, <laughs> built an earthly ministry of compassion and healing and spreading the word. He ultimately, of course, gave himself as a sacrifice on the hardwood of the cross at Calvary to save us from our sins. Our Messiah, the, the, uh, we, the system wasn't working, so we got a perfect Savior. At that intersect, that was the intersection at that point where we had the law and the truth, the righteousness, and the love that Christ provided when he died on the cross for us. And that is when, ultimately, when he paid that sin debt, that is when peace happened. So let's go back and listen to the psalmist again. He says in verse 10, Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Stead, the steadfast love and the faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Don't you love that imagery? Righteousness and peace kissing each other. 
That intent of peace happened when, of course, Christ died on the cross for us. Of course, we know that we have to accept that peace by believing that he died for us on the cross. We have to believe and receive that gift. Now, of course, we might ask the question, well, why don't we have peace in the world today? Well, that's because many in today's world are not of Christ. They are of the world. The ultimate peace will take place when Christ comes to establish that new Jerusalem on the holy mountain. And we talked about that um, when Chad read the epistle, our lesson today from Peter's letter to the Romans. It refers to a new heaven and a new earth that will be established after the Lord's desire for all to come to repentance. To, it's about ex, uh, the, accepting salvation by accepting Lord Jesus Christ as the personal Lord and Savior. And then lastly, Peter speaks about, he gives instruction about how the people, about how we should live while we wait. As a result of having that personal relationship with Christ, Peter speaks about living lives of holiness and godliness and striving to live in peace. It's about the removal of our old selfish ways and putting on the new clothes of Christ. When we do our best to walk in the path of righteousness, we are wearing those new clothes of Christ. This becomes our reality when, God, uh, when we love God and, of course, when we love others. When we have that oneness or that peace with God, that oneness and peace with others, this is that peace that passes understanding that we can carry with us in all situations, through the valleys and also on the mountaintops. It's with that peace that we can face what happens tomorrow because of what happened yesterday or the day before and, or, and uh, many years ago on the cross. Right now in our lives, peace comes with the absence of conflict. We may not be able to do anything directly about world or national level conflicts and crises, but we can do our best to maintain peace. That Hebrew word shalom, or oneness, that comes from our relationship with Christ and is nurtured by the Holy Spirit. We can promote that type of oneness, that type of peace within ourselves, Peace within our family, peace within our church family, peace within our workplace, peace within the community. Those are the things that we can do. The prophet Micah warned the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah that their future, about their future uh, destruction. He also spoke to them, and so that was going to happen without a doubt, but he also gave some encouragement about how they should approach the Lord with reverence and fear. Remember, not speaking about fear as being afraid, but fear as an awe and adoration. So he told them these things that they could, uh, the ways that they could, I uh, guess, live, even though they knew something was, they knew that destruction was coming. We go through difficult things ourselves. We may know of something difficult that's going to happen in the future even, but with that assurance of having Christ uh, as our personal Lord and Savior, we can't face what comes ahead. We can have that peace that passes understanding. Micah says, uh, this is from Micah 6, 8. He says, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. So he's saying that we should follow the law, follow the sacred scriptures. We should have compassion. We should love compassion and have an humble spirit. He's speaking about not getting caught up in rituals for the sake of doing them, but for whatever we do, to do it with the right heart. Sometimes we get caught up in doing things the same way, maybe the way we've done it in the past. Not that that's bad or wrong, if it is heartfelt. Uh, if the intent is not there, though, then the Lord God sees those, whatever those rituals are, perhaps even as empty. So it's about knowing the law, about the sacred scriptures, but also putting it into practice. So I'm trying to think of an example. If we were on the football field or basketball court, it would be like knowing the rules of the game, but not following them. So does that happen, right? That, that might be a conversation for another time. <laughs> so, but anyway, so it's about knowing the scripture, about having the love of Christ, putting it into practice, not just having that head knowledge, but applying it with our heart. Timothy Keller says, you must not rest content with Bible, with biblical knowledge and sound doctrine, 
but you must turn it all into worship and encompass your whole heart and life. The song I sang earlier was called Make Room, and it asked the question, it says, is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? This song speaks about trading. It, uh, it goes on to say, um, oh, but it, uh, it, you can come as you are. God accepts all of us as we are. He says, but it may set you apart coming to God when you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. Now, this, uh, this song even speaks about trading your dreams, your dreams. I don't think it's speaking of abandoning wishes and desires, but what I think that song was saying is this about putting God first. What must the shepherds abiding in the field, what must they have thought when an angel of the Lord spoke peace and good and, and goodwill to men? The angel said, and, uh, we know from uh, the Gospel of Luke, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will towards men. What must they have thought? I mean, they're out tending their sheep, and all of a sudden they see these bright lights and this uh, angel choir or singing or speaking to them. But they decided to believe, they decided to listen, and they decided to be obedient to God and seek that peace. In this season of Advent, as we prepare our hearts, may we ask the Lord God, to place that spirit of revival in us. Remember that plan that I talked about Tim Timothy Keller shared, looking in the past, repenting, crying out to God for his steadfast love and mercy, and waiting and listening for God's word. What would happen if we put the Lord God first in all that we do? Might he provide our wants and needs beyond our imagination? So not abandoning those desires, but putting God first and just waiting with anticipation of what he will do. How he will provide our heart's desire. We learn in that we read in the Psalm 37, the psalmist says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Put God first, and he will provide those heart desires. What if by making room and following his will, plan, and purpose for our lives, it just so happens that we experience those desires of our hearts? What if our desires are transformed into his plan that are manifested beyond our imagination? One year ago, I didn't know that there was a path for a lay person to follow that would lead to my ability to serve as your pastor. It was probably a little bit after this time last year that Jill's daughter, Lindsay and her husband Dylan learned that they would become parents. But that was after waiting and hoping and praying for, to God for what, Jill, over nine or ten years? God heard their prayers. He heard the cries of their hearts. They waited in anticipation, but they were faithful, and God was faithful. Friday, we had our food distribution. Uh, Wayne was there. Chad and Sophie have helped before. There were three of us that day uh, from our charge. Uh, representing uh, you know, our, our faith-based community. But what you don't know is the other, what, Wayne, there were 10, 12, 15. 12, 15. Yeah. The other 10 or more were community volunteers. These were people that had been coming to get food. Now they're coming to give food. So talking about the arms and legs and the feet and the hands of God, how about that oneness with others? So do you see how God has transformed that into a volunteer-based ministry? We had no idea that would happen uh, back in 2018 when I started having those conversations with Pastor Ross Chellis about trying to meet the needs of our community. While we actively wait, what would happen if we promoted peace within our relationship with the Lord, within ourselves, within our family, within our church, and beyond? Giovanni di Pietro uh, di Bernardo, also known as St. Francis of Assisi, he led a life of poverty as an itinerant preacher. He loved God and loved others. 
And he is uh, said to have stated, start by doing what is necessary, then what is possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Do what's necessary, then what's possible, then you're doing the impossible. I'd like to conclude by sharing a prayer written by St. Francis that speaks about being an instrument of peace. If you will, turn in your hymnal to 481, and I would like for us to read this prayer together. And I'll just be very honest, I was trying to come here today with a little copy of the prayer that you could take with you, and I was doing something with my computer, and all of a sudden it locked up and said, uh, call this number, blah, blah, blah. It was like, I knew it was some kind of hack. I did not do it. But anyway, so I apologize. I, I'm not leaving you. So take a picture of this prayer with your phone, if you will. But uh, this is the prayer of St. Francis, and I'm going to invite you to read this with me on page 481. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. This prayer speaks about sowing seeds of love, pardon, faith, hope, life, and joy. It also speaks about loving others. Do you see how that last part, uh, so the first part, um, uh, he's talking about uh, extending us extending these things, uh, love instead of hatred, pardon instead of injury. And then it gets to the place where it's us giving of ourselves first. Rather than looking to be consoled, may we do what? May we console others. Rather than seeking to be understood, understand. Rather than to be loved, to love. Rather than in giving, uh, and then it says, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoning, pardoned. And it is dying that we, of course, are born to eternal life. So it's about giving first, but then ultimately getting back. But it's about putting God first and loving others. Let us pray. Lord, may we surrender our lives to you. May we, may we be obedient to your will, plan, and purpose for our lives. May we love you, love others, and promote peace in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.